I was digging through my library the other day and I came across this dusty old uh, booklet, A Concise Reply to Christianity, A Muslim View by G. Miller. G. Miller, of course, is Dr. Gary Miller, who became a professor of mathematics. He was from Canada, Tron University of Toronto. I can find very, very little online now uh, of contemporary stuff about him. There are no contemporary videos of him, for example. Uh, I can't find any YouTube footage of him or anything on Wikipedia. Um, so he seems to have gone deliberately under, uh, under the radar, perhaps to avoid publicity, I don't know. But for a while in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, he was very high profile indeed. He worked with uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat uh, and he did numerous videos, many of which are still viewable on YouTube, forensically examining Christianity and talking about the Quran, particularly the truth of the Quran, the, 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 the miraculous nature of the revelation. Um, but this concise little booklet really shows his genius, I think, his brilliance, total brilliance in analysing Christianity, uh, exposing its weaknesses, its Achilles heel, and uh, and rebutting the classic Muslim uh, missionary tactics against Muslims. Um, I'd love to read the whole thing, but it's, uh, it's quite long. Uh, it is very concise. Uh, you know, every sentence is meaningful uh, and impactful, I think. So I'll just read a few bits of it just to give you a flavour. Um, and I don't know if this could ever be republished. It certainly deserves to be. Uh, he writes at the beginning, Christians and Muslims who learn something of one another's religion find that a crucial issue is the nature of Jesus. The majority of Christians deify Jesus, while Muslims say that he was no more than a prophet of God, a faultless human being. The doctrine of the Trinity avows three distinct co-equals, our God. In particular, Jesus said to be God the Son or the Son of God. As the Muslim questions details of this theology, the Christian characteristically forms a common explanation for our differences. He complains that Muslims do not understand the Trinity, that we are actually accusing Christians of tritheism and other heresies. So the Muslim seeks clarification of the teaching and asks every term, how could that be so? For example, we insist that the term son of God cannot have a literal interpretation. Sonship and divine nature would be necessary attributes of such an actuality, but these are incompatible. The first describes a recipient of life, while the second describes one who has received life from no one. These are mutually exclusive requirements, then. To be a son is to be less than divine, and to be divine is to be no one's son. As a discussion proceeds, it is the Christian who will eventually take refuge in the response. These are things that cannot be understood. His assessment of the Muslim's problem becomes his own confession. The Christian explanation becomes self-defeating, so there is a change of tactic. He complains that the Muslim refuses to accept what cannot be understood. But the modified approach is a diversion. Now the concepts of verification and understanding are confused. To illustrate, chemical reactions may be verified, but the atom is not thereby understood. Facts are catalogued, but not always explained. This distinction is the key to our concise reply. It is the Muslim who must redirect the discussion. Our primary issue is more basic than resolving the incongruities of Trinitarian doctrine. Rather than ask how the Trinity can be so, we should ask why it must be so. We ask, why must Jesus be divine? Can we verify the necessity of this belief? A few centuries ago, European philosophies, philosophers commonly felt that a conjecture was proven if it could be shown to be equivalent to an assertion made by Aristotle, is the Greek philosopher. Unfortunately, such an approach stopped short of challenging Aristotle and discovering truth. Similarly, resting the Trinitarian case on what people have said about Jesus stops short of establishing the integrity of the authorities and the truth of the matter. Our purpose here is no more than, an, than the illustration that belief in the Trinity can only be based on church authority, in other words, the Catholic position. Many Christians admit that this is the case, 
while others insist that the teaching was elaborated by Jesus himself. Let them produce their proof is the re repeated admonition of the Quran, that is, provide the documentation that Jesus himself claimed unqualified deity, Quran 21-24. Unless this evidence can be produced, authorities are subject to challenge. Then the Christian may not evade the Muslim's questions concerning understanding. The Christian will have no justification for maintaining an illogical position unless he is content to rely on the opinions of men. If he will probe no deeper than this, the Christian, the Christian Muslim dialogue is finished. The, record, the Bible record of sayings credited to Jesus is quite meagre. After allowance for duplication in our four gospel accounts, these sayings could be printed in two columns of a newspaper. None of this handful of text is an explicit claim to deity. All quotations are implicit, that is, they require interpretation. We are told what Jesus said and then told what he meant. This is classic. I always get this. You know, oh, Jesus said X. I said yes. And then they tell me what it means. But of course, that's the point of dispute. So our methodology, he says, takes an obvious form. It is not our intention or obligation to reinterpret the Bible. We are satisfied to merely verify that Christian interpretations are insufficient, ambiguous or impossible. And then he gives an example of insufficient evidence. The virgin birth of Jesus and the miracles he demonstrated are cited by some Christians as proof of his divinity. The insufficiency of the premise is obvious. We need only read the biblical account of Adam's creation in Genesis without father or mother and the accounts of the miracles associated with the prophet Elisha in 2 Kings chapters 4, 5 and 6. In the case of these two men, no Christian asserts their divinity, yet each has a qualification in common with Jesus. Some maintain that Jesus was God because the Hebrew scriptures predicted his coming. The inadequacy here is only slightly less apparent. The Hebrew scriptures also are cited as predicting the role of John the Baptist, Malachi 4. These three arguments are mentioned to show that the ready claims of Christians betray a selective or forgetful recall of Scripture. They know the fact of virgin birth as well as they know the account of Adam's origins, yet they interpret the first and overlook the second. Now to pursue our case directly. Does the Bible quote Jesus as claiming equality with God? The Bible texts, Bible texts are produced to show that Jesus used the terms Son of Man, Son of God, Messiah and Saviour. But each of these terms is applied to other individuals in the Bible. Ezekiel was addressed as Son of Man in Ezekiel chapter 3. Jesus himself speaks of peacemakers as sons of God, Matthew 5, 9. Cyrus, the Persian king, emperor, is called Messiah at Isaiah 45, verse 1. The duplicity of translators is manifest here, for they inevitably render only the meaning of the word Messiah, which is anointed. In other words, they don't use the word Messiah, they use just the meaning. When, where other Bible verses seem to refer to Jesus, they prefer to transliterate Messiah, or the Greek equivalent, Christ. In this way, they hope to give the impression that there is only one Messiah. But of course, in the Bible, there are lots and lots of Messiahs. As for Saviour, the word is applied to other than Jesus, 2 Kings 13, 5. Christians choose to cite the 43rd chapter of Isaiah as proof that there is only one Saviour. Again, translators have tried to obscure the fact that God is the only Saviour in the, in the same ultimate sense that he is our only nourisher and protector, though men also have these assigned tasks. By over-specifying this pronouncement in Isaiah, they hope to have us believe that God equals Saviour and Jesus equals Saviour, therefore Jesus equals God. The conspiracy of modern translation is easily demonstrated. The King James Bible of 1611 is everywhere available. 
Compare it to a more recent translation, say the New American Bible of this century. In the earlier version, we find 2 Kings 13.5 contains the word saviour. But in newer versions, the synonymous word deliverer has been substituted. In fact, saviours, plural, will be found in Obadiah 21 and Nehemiah 9.27. Here again, by substituting a different word, the connotation of divinity tied to the word saviour has been guarded in modern versions by less than honest translation. Uh, now, I could go on. This, this is just packed full of uh, amazing, accurate, cogent, forensically, searingly logical argument, um, which is very, very rare. I mean, that's why I maintain... Uh, that he was a genius. I'd love to read the whole thing out, but it would probably take an hour uh, to, to, to do, and uh, limitations of YouTube would not allow that, I think. So um, if anyone knows what is happening with Dr. Gary Miller today, it would be wonderful to hear. But um, I, I, he is one of the, the great geniuses of uh, Muslim apologetics, and uh, I just wish there were more like him today. Until next time.